We're taking a look at the week ahead and asking, what would Buffett do? You're in the right place because this is where the money is. All right, guys, as always, we start with a look at the headlines. So the first one is Bloomberg. Uh, the, uh, the headline is Berkshire avoids route as Buffett sidesteps bonds. So, Matt, tell me again what a genius Warren Buffett is. <laughs> Where do you want me to start? <laughs> well, let's focus on the bonds part here. Well, you know, one issue that we've been looking at, it, particularly in the financial industry over this quarter, has, has been the, the losses on bond portfolios. Uh, we've seen this with banks. We've seen this with insurance companies. And so there would be the expectation that we'd see that with Berkshire Hathaway because they have very large insurance operations, they have a very large investment portfolio. However, you've got a lot of investments here that are over on the equity side, invested in stocks. Buffett's known for holding a lot of stocks in the Berkshire Hathaway umbrella. You've got Wells Fargo in there, you've got Coca-Cola in there. Stocks have been doing tremendously well, and this really helped uh, Berkshire on that front. Yeah, I mean, it was a great quarter, and you have to remember that it, this is just a quarter. If we have a quarter where stocks are down 20% and, and bonds rally, then it might be a little bit of a different picture. But historically, obviously, stocks have outperformed bonds in the long run. That's kind of where Buffett's sweet spot is. But like Matt said, it's, it's not a really good company for a apples to apples comparison to a, a Travelers or, or a MetLife insurance company like that, just because Berkshire has much more diversified operations in railroads, energy. So it's not exactly a clear picture to say, oh, the other company should be more heavily invested in equities. It's a little bit of a different picture with Berkshire. All right, next up, American Banker uh, headline today, banks capitalize on real estate rebound by unloading seized homes. So. The housing market is improving, and this is good news for the banks, um, right, David? Yeah, I mean, a couple, a couple, <laughs> a couple of years ago, one of the big overhangs for these banks and for these stocks was these banks have a lot of real estate on their books. Who knows when they're going to unload it, at what discounts they're going to unload it. With the housing market coming back now, they've been able to get a little bit better prices than a lot of people are expecting and reduce that real estate that they're holding on their books. So that's kind of getting checked off the checklist. One of the other things that was overhanging a lot of the big banks after the financial crisis was, who knows what's on these books? I don't know what these securities are. The banks took a lot of write downs pretty early on, so they got that out of the way. So you got the real estate out of the way, you got these securities marked write downs out of the way. And now one, really the biggest overhang in my opinion is just regulation. Because when you look at the big banks, those are the ones, so we're talking about Bank of America, Citigroup, those are the ones that haven't seen their valuations really, and, and the multiples really go back up to levels where they were prior to the financial crisis. So I think when you look at those big ones, a lot of it is just the regulatory uncertainty. What's going to be taken away out of these operations? What are they going to be able to do in the next five years? So that's really the biggest overhang going forward. I mean, to go back to the, the core of the story here, it's, it's good news for the banks, but it's not unrelated to the strength in the housing market, at least in terms of the prices. Uh, we've got a supply-demand imbalance here. We've got people that are finally interested again in buying houses, and there's just not a lot that's on the market, and a lot of that is being held on banks' balance sheets. So it'll be interesting to see over, not really the next quarter or a couple of quarters, really, but over the next year, as, as the home builders are looking at these prices going up, as the banks are looking at prices going up, and you start to see more supply come onto the market, at what point you get, you've got that equilibrium again. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's it for the headlines. Now we're going to take a deeper dive. Uh, there has been a lot of talk lately about the potential fall off in mortgage originations and fees, but how bad could it get? Cop, you've done some research into this? I've done some, yeah. It's, you know, the, the data out there is kind of uh, iffy in certain places. And the banks prior to the financial crisis really were not good about really breaking everything out so that investors could get a detailed view of what was going on. And for somebody gathering data, that is a little bit frustrating. <laughs> Uh, however, you know, when, when you look back at the numbers, one thing that really stands out, and, and this, is, th this is a key thing to remember as we worry about, okay, interest rates are going up, refinan refinancing activity is slowing down, the purchase home activity is still way below what it, what it uh, normally is. Normal is a, is a tough thing to define in the housing market here, but we've seen much, 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 much higher levels of, of purchase activity in the housing market. I think that we will see a recovery in that. I mean, rising interest rates could impact that a little bit, but one of the key things to remember is that we've got new families forming, we've got kids graduating college, we've got all kind of you know, people moving into the country. There's, there's demand, there's constantly growing demand 
for places for people to live. And even to the extent that people aren't buying homes, people need places to live. So if they're not buying homes, then somebody else has got to buy the home to rent it to them. Mm -hmm. and, and we've actually seen a, a lot of that activity of, of uh, private buyers, like Blackstone is a great example, just snapping up a lot of single family homes uh, to, to, to be able to rent them back out. So in, in terms of the fee income that the banks get, so you know Wells Fargo and JP Morgan at the very top of the mortgage origination spectrum, Bank of America up there not too far behind. This is where it gets a little bit tricky and a little bit interesting is that the capacity for mortgage lending got cut down in a big way after the financial crisis. And so what ended up happening is you, you sort of have two parts to the, the mortgage fee thing here. There's the volume. How, so how many mortgages are you doing? How many refinancings are you doing? How many purchase, purchase uh, originations are you doing? But then there's a margin. So when you make the loan and then when you sell it off to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, there's a margin in there and, and that multiplied by your volume, that's basically that fee income. So what happened is when you cut down on the number of people doing it, on the uh, capacity to do mortgage originations, those, uh, those uh, uh, margins expanded tremendously. So I think that is actually the bigger concern here than the volume, because I think the volume can be made up as refinancings fall, those purchases come back on, but the, the margins I think are gonna contract, and I don't know that we're gonna see that expand back out the, the way it was after the financial crisis. So what should we expect in terms of, of fee income? I don't know, it's gonna be down. It's gonna be down probably substantially, and I don't think that we should expect over the coming years to see similar levels. I, I David, think it's, do you wanna contradict me? I think, don't you dare no, contradict I'm not, me. not contradicting. I think, I like what you said when you said it's hard to put kind of what's normal in the housing market, because it's never just a plateau, this is what it is. Uh, but I think the takeaway for investors is if you hold a bank that does mortgage banking, to go in there and really look how much of their net income is from mortgage banking because we talk about Wells Fargo, Bank of America, JP Morgan, the percentage of mortgage banking that they get on their top line revenue, it varies vastly between each of those three. So when you, even when you get to the regional players, if you own a regional bank, go in there and just find how much of this income is really from mortgage banking. It may be 2% and then it's not really that material to that bank per se, as opposed to if there's a bank that gets 25% of their revenue from this mortgage banking. So I think the takeaway for investors is to go in bank by bank if you hold that stock and really just try to understand where does that bank sit. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really good point. David and I were looking at a smaller bank uh, at the end of last week that had an overwhelming amount of its revenue coming in through mortgage origination. So, you know, you think about a, a Wells Fargo, uh, again, or Bank of America or J.P. Morgan, billions of dollars uh, of fees coming in through mortgage banking activities. So that seems very significant in terms of if there's a, if there's a fall off. But it's still a very, not a very small, but it's a small part of the overall picture. So, you know, you, you see a drop off of a third, you see a drop off of 50%, it's gonna hurt, but it's not gonna imperil the bank. But, you know, you look at a smaller bank, if it's got an overwhelming exposure to mortgage originations, uh, the, the fees for mortgage originations and sales, that can be a big problem if that falls off drastically. All right. Well, that's enough uh, talking about that. <laughs> Let's move on to looking at the week ahead. Uh, David, what are you keeping an eye on this week? So this week, uh, Annalee Capital, they don't give us a hard date when they're reporting their earnings, but most likely it will be this week. Um, Two Harbors, another mortgage REIT, is also reporting this week. And the mortgage REIT sector as a whole has just been crushed the last three months or so with rising interest rates. These two not crushed as much as uh, an American capital agency, uh, perhaps. Annalee, because it's kind of the, the biggest in the space, one of the oldest in the space, their management team, I think, gets a little bit more leeway with the market in terms of how they're gonna manage things. Two Harbors, on the other hand, is a little bit more diversified. So we look at Annalee Capital, majority of their portfolio is agency mortgage-backed securities. That is, they're backed by Freddie and Fannie. They don't have to worry about default risk, per se, on those securities. Two Harbors, on the other hand, they dabble in the, the subprime mortgage-backed securities, a little bit more of that dangerous stuff. So they're a little bit more diversified, but also deal with credit risk a little bit more. So it'll be very interesting to see how these, how these two companies fared in the second quarter. Uh, so we'll get those results this week. Should be interesting. All right, Matt, what are you looking at this week? I'm looking at the economic calendar, which is pretty quiet. 
and pretty boring. We had a huge. Oh, that's exciting. Huge, well, then let's move on. Huge I, week you're last week. You're really selling it to me. There was here. a huge week last <laughs> week. We had GDP. We had the the FOMC rate decision. We had the labor numbers. Uh, this week. I mean, I, I'm looking at this calendar, initial unemployment claims, everybody always takes a look at that. Other than that, you can probably take a, a week off to some extent <laughs> from looking at, at the, the economic numbers. Next week, there will be a little bit more activity. But one thing I want to point out, later this week, we will have Motley Fool contributor Morgan Housel on this show talking about the economic numbers and uh, and that'll be exciting he's great at really distilling that down to uh, to the most important uh, facts I like what you said you said take the week off from looking at the macro I love that you take I, I want to take every week off from the macro <laughs> take every week investors off. out there take this week off from the macro and focus on the companies that's the more important thing yeah all right so uh, Morgan's gonna be here with you guys on Wednesday yes. is that right so he's one of the the much beloved uh, um, writers here for the fool so um, something not to miss. All right. So now, David, you said that you are watching two mortgage REITs this week, mm -hmm. um, at Annaly Capital and two Harbors. Right. So we wanted to take a moment and play a little game here. What would Buffett do? And the question is, what would Buffett do if he ran a mortgage REIT? Uh, specifically or not specifically, feel free to, to come at it as however you want. Matt, do you want to start? Sure, sure. So. The first thing I'll start with is the mortgage REITs, it's not one umbrella term that defines a specific thing in that there are some that focus on one particular type of security. There are others that are more flexible. Uh, Annalia Capital, for instance, and American Capital Agency, two of the largest mortgage REITs, they focus primarily on what's called agency-backed mortgage-backed securities. That means they're backed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. There are others like Two Harbors that is more flexible. Uh, they do some investing in agency-backed securities. They invest as well in non-agency-backed securities. If Warren Buffett were running a mortgage, uh, a mortgage REIT, first of all, I don't know that Warren Buffett would want to run a mortgage REIT, but since I'm in this situation and I have to answer this question, I, I think first of all, one of the things that makes Buffett so great is his ability at capital allocation. So I think he would structure the, the mortgage REIT to give him maximal flexibility. Because if, if, you're, if you're focused on, say, agency-backed securities, then you're focused on agency-backed securities. It's kind of like being a, um, you know, a, a growth mutual fund. If you're a growth mutual fund, then you probably have some sort of style box that you're in. And you always have to buy these growth companies, whether they're expensive, whether they're cheap, it doesn't matter. Same thing with agency mortgage-backed securities. So, so Buffett would want to be able to look at you know, the, the, the full array of mortgage-backed securities, figure out what's cheap, where's a good place to put the money. And actually, I, I think he'd want the ability as well to be able to put some money towards, uh, towards equity real estate. Um, that's, so, so that's more traditional REIT kind of play. But if that's a good place to put money, I mean, single-family homes, commercial buildings, that sort of thing, he'd want to be able to do that. So. I think the number one thing that Warren Buffett would do if he were running a mortgage REIT would, would be to make sure he has maximal flexibility in where he can put the money. I, I think those are good points. I'm going to attack it a little great, bit differently. Great, great points. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you set it up so he has pretty wide flexibility. Some of these REITs, it's important to note that their investment guidelines and policies make them have a certain amount of uh, the portfolio allocated to agency mortgage-backed securities. So if we look at a company like Annaly Capital, I think it's 75% has to be in agency mortgage-backed securities or very high-quality like AAA, highly rated securities that are almost uh, risk-free uh, from a default perspective. Uh, so if Warren Buffett was running Annaly Capital, I think what he would do, or what I, yeah, what I think he would do is, I think he would sacrifice the interest income that these mortgage REITs make. So mortgage REITs make interest income off the security that they hold so those bonds pay them, and they filter that money through to their shareholders. They have to, by law, 90% uh, because they're a REIT, they get special tax uh, exemptions there. I think Warren Buffett would sacrifice that interest in com coming in and really reduce that, uh, the duration of the portfolio and kind of build the portfolio strong today, sacrifice that interest income that's coming in, and prepare for a higher rate environment in the future. So I think that's, I think he would take the pain, the short-term pain. Would day trade mortgage-backed securities? I th no, I think, I think he would get out of that business and strengthen the balance sheet <laughs> to allow it to, to thrive in the future years. And when Annalie reports earnings this week, 
That's what I hope they do. I'm an annually shareholder, and if they come out and say, look, the dividend's probably gonna be cut because we're sacrificing net income for the strength of our balance sheet in the long term, I'm happy with that. I'm sure a lot of people would be very upset with that. Some people rely on that dividend, which I certainly understand, but for the long-term health of the company, I think it might be better to sacrifice short-term for the long-term gain. I think you would get out of the REIT structure by GEICO and, <laughs> and take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's, there's what, what we think Warren Buffett would do and uh, our advice for him if he does ever want to get into, <laughs> into mortgage REITs. There you go, some free advice for you. All right, <laughs> now it's time to head to the Twitters. The first one comes from Sheila Bear, at Sheila Bear 23... Ooh. Wait, maybe I have her Twitter address wrong. <laughs> anyway. It's possible. All right, just you can find her. She's kind of a big deal. So, so, uh, she's Sheila Bear. She's Sheila Bear. <laughs> All right, the tweet is, how to take down a big bake. This can work. And she links to a Financial Times article here. Matt, what uh, what was Sheila Bear reading this morning? It, it was all about the, the resolution authority. So, so basically, as we, as we came out of the financial crisis, there was, you know, there's this meme that continues the too big to fail thing, that, that some banks are so big that they can't possibly fail. And, and maybe that's true. Maybe that's true the way that things are. But I, I hate this idea. And I hate the idea that the only way to deal with it is to say that, oh, we've got to break them up and make them smaller. And you can never, ever have a big bank. We've got big, giant companies in basically every industry. We've got companies with giant pieces of market share in, in, every, in almost every industry. And I, I think what we have to do is just make sure that everybody's clear that these big banks can fail, make sure that there's a process in place, and there can be a process in place, as Sheila tells us, mm -hmm. and as the FT article explains, uh, that, that there can be a process in place that these banks can fail. And, you know, there, there are advantages to scale. There are advantages to the, the companies to have that kind of scale. There are advantages to the, cons the, to the consumers. I, I'm, I'm talking so fast and I'm so fired up about this that I'm tripping <laughs> over my words. But I feel very strongly about this that, um, you know, I don't like the idea that there's any type of company out there that, that can take risks and, and, and won't be able to fail. And it, this isn't, I mean, w when you look back, the shareholders did suffer. Look at the shareholders of Citigroup, or look at the share prices of Citigroup. Look at the share price of Bank of America. If you held either of those stocks before the financial crisis, you suffered. You, you definitely suffered. You didn't get wiped out, but you suffered. The bondholders, on the other hand, not so much. We just have to make it clear that if banks, no matter how big you are, if, if, if they make a wrong turn, everybody's going to suffer. The bondholders are going to take a hit. The stockholders are going to get wiped out, period. So, so we're a company that focuses mostly on stocks. We don't dabble in the corporate bonds of Bank of America or Citigroup. So for, for common stock shareholders, does it even really matter? Uh, they're already the last kind of the ones to get anything left if something was to go bankrupt. Are you, if you're buying those stocks today, is it kind of if they have the living wills and fail, it doesn't really matter because you're already last in line. Or what? I, it matters from a big picture perspective, right? And, and it matters from having a, a fair and equal playing ground. I mean, I think there's there is going to be a funding uh, uh, advantage to any company that 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 bondholders look at and say this is too big to fail. Mm -hmm. If I put money to, into this, if I fund this as a bondholder, I can fund it at a lower cost because there's less risk, and that's. Not cool, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, I, I don't know how large that was. There's, there's some, there have been some combative studies that, that have shown one way or the other, mm -hmm. and particularly that after the financial crisis, maybe that advantage disappeared. But either way, if there's the, the remaining perception that these banks can't fail, it's not going to be good for the overall economy. It's not going to be good for the financial system. And, and I, so I think that the solution, rather than saying we've got to break them up into little teeny tiny pieces and you can never have a big bank, it's making it very clear that there is a plan in place that we are very serious about. If you make these kind of mistakes again, you're going down. Right. All right. Next one comes from our own Joe Mager. He's the advisor on Motley Fool Inside Value. Uh, you can follow him at at M-A-G-Y-E-R. It's a very highly regarded Inside Value, I will say. Yes. It appeared in the, uh, in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend as one of the top uh, fun, uh, one of the top stock newsletters. The top. Yep. The Number top one. For the last five years. Yep. Yeah, check it out on the Wall Street Journal on Saturday. Um, very exciting. So Joe's having a good, he's having a good week. Um, and Joe's tweet that we're pulling out today is, Berkshire's warrants in Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, and General Electric are now in the money by a combined $8 billion. Hashtag YOLO. What can you say? I mean, the tweet sums it up. It, it, you can attack this from a couple different angles. One, 
we said it earlier in the show, I mean, you're right, this is turning into like the Warren Buffett praise hour, but it's, <laughs> it's really impressive, the fact that you look at these situations. Two bits. <laughs> and the, well, the, the Goldman Sachs Warrens and the Bank of America Warrens, it's important to remember that those were at different times, too. He didn't get the Bank of America warrants at the depths of the recession. The Bank of America warrants came in at 2011, I think September 2011. Uh, it's pretty impressive. He, it's not like he was sitting there in March 2009 at the very bottom of the market and swooped in and got all these. So even after that recovery, to some extent, uh, with the broader economy, he was still in there making great deals. And in three companies that y you can argue that maybe you don't like Bank of America, maybe you don't like Goldman Sachs, but these are all companies that are going to be around for the next 10, 15 years. I don't think anyone would probably question that Goldman Sachs, GE, and Bank of America are going to be around. So we got great brands, business that are going to be around for a long time. and got great deals. I mean, it's a win-win for, for Berkshire shareholders and Buffett. A lot of capital at Berkshire, patient capital at Berkshire, and you've got Buffett there, like David said, identifying quality companies. I, like you said, some people may argue with it. Goldman Sachs, Quality, quality company. I mean, that's that's where I'm coming from. GE, quality company. Bank of America, <laughs> on the on the borderline. I think it can get there. Buffett, I guess, thinks it can get there. Um, but but I, you know, the tweet says it all. Eight billion dollars. And and it's you can make the argument that these stocks, a lot of these stocks, especially Goldman, and Bank of America, they're still trading well below kind of what the historical multiples are for those banks. So you could make the argument. I will make that argument. You, Matt of, often makes that argument that these are still undervalued. So $8.5 billion now, that could be a lot more in the future. All right. You only live once, <laughs> as Joe ended that one with. All right. The next one uh, comes from Business Insider. Why Google's Sergey Brin paid 330000 for the first lab-grown beef burger. So the question is, Matt, how much would you pay for a lab-grown hamburger? Well. I guess the first question is, and David asked me this earlier today, which I'm, I'm still mulling over, is this vegetarian? Because I'm a vegetarian. So if it's not vegetarian, which I would have trouble thinking that it is, I probably wouldn't pay anything for the first lab-grown burger. But assuming that I did still eat burgers, I would pay substantially less than $330,000. I'd go $3. Three dollars. Three dollars would probably be the peak of what I'd maybe it, if it had cheese and it was on a bun and maybe a special sauce as well. All <laughs> the, the whole thing. Three dollars. Yeah, two all beef lab grown special patties. I would. Minus cheese. I would throw down some money if it came with, if it came with like the a stock around this idea. I'm I'm for this idea. <laughs> I'm all for it. If there's like if there's like a lab grown capital management, I'm buying shares in that. In capital. <laughs> I mean, we see Sergey Brin makes it, make this. We're investment talking about now. one one hamburger here. One. Lab it, this isn't this, this isn't necessarily a, a brand new story though. I think Peter Thiel, who of course made his name through the the Facebook and the PayPal investments, he's invested in this lab grown beef or whatever. So I think there's something to it. Those are two pretty smart guys, and I wouldn't I wouldn't count it out that we're going to be eating it in ten years or so. I don't here's know. here's what I, here's what I'm picturing. I'm picturing David spending. Ten thousand, fifty thousand dollars on this burger, eating it on YouTube, getting food poisoning, and then getting and then getting millions of hits on YouTube of people watching him mm -hmm. enjoy. I assume enjoy. I'll enjoy it. You, yeah, he'd enjoy it. I'm, enjoy I'm in this burger. I'm buying it. All right. Well, no one asked me, but personally, you would have to pay me three hundred thirty thousand dollars <laughs> to get me to eat a lab-grown hamburger. So, all right. Well, I think that covers it for today. On behalf of Matt Kaufman-Heffer and David Hansen, we'll see you tomorrow. This is where the money is.